few years ago, a young Israeli family from a kibbutz in the Negev relocated to California. The Negev is a desert. It is hot, it is dry, it is tough, it is not the easiest place to live in. After a few days in California, the little girl came back from school, informing her parents that she learned a new song. The parents knew long ago that the child is a genius, but now they got the actual proof. Only a few days in the United States, and the girl is fluent in English. And they asked little Einstein to sing the song, and she did. And the song is, Rain, rain, go away, come again another day. There was silence in the room. The parents were in shock. They were very proud with their little girl, but at the same time, they could not believe anyone would tell the rain to go away. Bear in mind, those are people that grew up in the desert. Telling a rain to go away is a sin. It's a crime. It's unheard of. I heard this story from the father a friend of mine who used to work for one of the Israeli water companies. And I found it amusing and funny. And then I thought about the Israeli water children's songs. And they all have the same message. Feel free to sing along. <laughs> And there are plenty of other songs, but they all have the same messages. We either express joy and happiness with the fact that the rain is here, or begging the rain to come back and water the flowers and trees. Bottom line, you never tell the rain to go away. Israelis like very much to travel abroad. And when they come back, they would usually comment on the amount of water that they saw during their trip. And it is always said in a tone of admiration and jealousy. So people would say, we hiked in the Himalaya, we did rafting in the Grand Canyon, bungee jumping in Thailand. It was very beautiful. And then you hear the inevitable comment, and there is so much water there. And it comes with a little moan at the end, kind of, this is not fair. God didn't do a proper job distributing this important resource. But what can we do? We have to make up with what we got. Making up with what we got, this is Limor my beloved life partner. When it comes to water, Limor is an extremist. She is fully committed to water saving. Whenever we wash fruits and vegetables, Limor would put a pot underneath, collect the water, and then irrigate the garden. My dear, I have a confession. Sometimes when you are not in the kitchen, <laughs> I cheat and I do not collect the water. <laughs> but other than that, I'm a good guy. <laughs> I drink tap water. I close the tap when I brush my teeth. I use half the amount of water in the toilet when I can. I irrigate at night to avoid evaporation. I told you, a good guy. <laughs> now, why is it so important? The amount of water that Limor is saving is insignificant. The children's songs are cute and nice. Nevertheless, they don't save water on their own. But these acts, these songs, reflect a culture, a culture of a water-saving society. When people share the same values and act accordingly, when you have children's songs that deliver a message, when you have extremists like Limor, but also the average Joe is knowledgeable and aware, then you are on the right track. 
Some people are lucky to have their work and values aligned. I am one of those lucky guys. I have a great job. I know it's not common to hear it from a public servant. <laughs> Governments are not accustomed to happy employees, and they don't really know what to do with them. <laughs> I deal with water issues from different point of views and angles. And my mission is to make a change. A very neat part of my job is the fact that it requires traveling quite often to different parts of the world, meeting and speaking with opinion leaders, politicians, companies, water utilities, investors, international and financial organizations, all players in the global water arena. So this is the nice part. The part which is not so nice is the fact that the global water picture is scary. Two months ago, I visited Brazil. Staying in Brasilia, the capital of the country, I learned that due to water shortage, there is a rotation between neighborhoods in the city. And each neighborhood, one day a week, doesn't get water. And this is not only in Brasilia. Many cities around the world, in Africa, in the Middle East, India, China, are facing similar situation. Recently, even Rome in Italy has difficulties meeting water demand. When I meet with CEOs of large multinationals, I always ask them, what is your strategy to water as a business sector? And I get a lot of different, interesting answers. But they all complain over the fact that the business models are not right. One of the most interesting and depressing answers was from one of the biggest companies in the world. And they said they are waiting for the situation to get worse. Not that they wish for that, but they think it is inevitable. And then when the situation is desperate, they will move in. Water pricing is at the heart of the discussion about the business models. It is a very delicate, sensitive topic. Water is God's gift to mankind is a phrase that I hear very often when I travel around in the world. And it captures very accurately the way we perceive water as a gift. And a gift is something that you do not pay for. It is free. And you use it as you please. This perception is a big obstacle. It undermines our ability to create a functional, sustainable water system. Water should cost money, all type of water, to all type of consumers. The water contamination tragedy in Flint, Michigan, took many lives. It showed us that managing water issues properly is a global challenge. It should concern every person on Earth. The situation in the dry countries in the U.S., Nevada, Arizona, California, calls for immediate action. Necessity is the mother of innovation is correct. When mankind is under pressure, people are creative, and they find ways to overcome difficulties and challenges. But there is another side to the same coin when we do not perceive the situation as a necessity, then the right terminology to describe our mindset is, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, means don't bother us. Don't bother us with those ideas, concepts, technologies. We like things the way they are. We want to stick to business as usual. But the big problem is that the global water system is already broken. And we ignore it. 
This is the big elephant in the room. We need to talk about it. We need to discuss it, and we need to come up with solutions. The United Nations, the OECD, the World Economic Forum, International Water Association, all clearly indicates if we continue managing water the way we do, in 20 years, 66% of humanity is going to suffer from severe water shortage. Already at present, the situation is alarming. On average, 25% of our urban water is lost before we use it. Due to poor maintenance and old infrastructure, and this is the average. Some cities around the world reach 60 and even 70% of water loss. In the developing world, only 10% of wastewater is being treated, which means that the vast majority of wastewater goes back to nature untreated, contaminating everything on its way. The global water system must be fixed. But for no good reason, we think that somehow this problem would go away. That next year we're going to have a lot of rain. That somehow the aquifer will be restored. Flowers and butterflies everywhere. And we're all going to live happily ever after. So this is not the right approach. Fairy tales are not going to correct the situation. Technological solutions exist. Efficient irrigation, smart urban water management system, wastewater treatment facilities and reuse, cost-effective desalination, and much more. Moreover, Technology keeps improving all the time. Usage of big data, sophisticated algorithm, nanotechnology, all bring us to the conclusion technology is not the barrier. What are the barriers? Lack of awareness, lack of sustainable business models, lack of relevant pricing policy, lack of clear legal frameworks, and abundance of conservativeness, those are the barriers. We need a revolution. We need a deep revolution. We need a revolution that will move simultaneously, top down and bottom up. We need people and public opinion to push politicians and political leaders. We need those leaders to become real leaders. Embrace the change and understand that business as usual is not an option. Are we going to do it with children's songs? Well, this is not enough. But this is a crucial point to begin with. This is the way society can change. And I am 100% sure that without a solid base, an outcome of a cultural change and a mind shift, we will not be able to move forward. So yes, this is a very important topic. What kind of children's songs do you remember from your childhood? What kind of children's songs do your children sing today? And I'll tell you this. We need joyful children's songs in every language in the world. This is a good start for a positive revolution. Thank you. <laughs>